It's not a journey. It's people's lives that are expiring while others procrastinate. John, I'm delighted to be here with you today, here in Basel, in our beautiful Novartis Pavilion. But not only am I excited to have you here, I'm most excited with the content topic that we're going to have for this fireside chat, um, which is really going to be around exploring elements of your book, mm -hmm. um, but most importantly, picking out the elements of your book that really lend itself to leadership and the importance of leadership in diversity, equity and inclusion. So my first question for you you talk a lot about everybody can be a giant. Mm -hmm. Help me p unpick that a little bit more. Help me understand what you mean by that. So, so I was asked the other day, someone asked me about the title of the book, which is The Promises of Giants, and they thought that it was about me because I am a physical giant. And I, and I reflected back to them that, no, it's about you. It's about the fact that in organisations, everybody is a giant to somebody. Sometimes it's obvious, it's rank it's title, it's, it's your position in the hierarchy, but sometimes it's more subtle, it's tenure, the number of years you've been around. Sometimes it's one unique piece of insight you have and hold and nobody else has. Uh, sometimes you went to the right school and sometimes you have the right network. But almost everybody, everybody is a giant to somebody else. And even if it's just that one person who's so grateful because when they first joined, you were the first person to say hello and ask them how they were. You instantly transform into someone who is potentially a role model. So that's what it is to be a giant. It's to, the idea is to stop people from abdicating the responsibility because it's all easier for us to say, we're part of this massive organization. Yeah. How can I possibly make a difference? But you can. Just look around you. There's someone with that look on their face just waiting for you to be their giant. One area I want to explore with you is unconscious bias. Having read the book and obviously got to know some of your, your theories, mm. um, it's clear that you don't quite see that as a thing that large organisations should potentially invest in. Yeah, I mean, you can't fix something that isn't real. Mm. You know, it's like me imagining that I am overweight because I drink a lot of tea. We can institute a regime where I drink progressively less tea. Mm with the expectation that I will lose weight then. But I'm not overweight because I drink tea. I'm overweight because I have a pizza once a week and I eat donuts more regularly than I have water. That's why I'm overweight. So if I want to do something about being overweight, it's the donuts and the pizza that have to be changed, not the tea. Mm. But it's easier to change the tea, isn't it? Anytime I see somebody add a word to something, I always wonder why, why add the modifier? Yeah. What does it add to our understanding? Bias is enough, right? Bias is enough. So why did you add unconscious? What does that add to the picture? Oh, the idea that it's not your fault is what it adds. It's buried deep inside me. So I think if you want to tackle bias and the fact that we are all programmed with a huge set of assumptions around people who are different than us, then you have to have, have people acknowledge those assumptions. Uh, and, and until we acknowledge that, it'll leak out in mm. our behavior. But once we acknowledge it, we can start to think more carefully about, hmm, I was thinking about saying this to Hannah, but I've realized that it was a knee-jerk reaction that came from this yeah. bias inside of me. And instead, I'll not. And that's how simple it is, by the way. It's yeah. not some complex formula. It's shutting our mouth. That's it. I'm just not going to say it. Mm. And the thing is, everybody has that skill. Put them in front of a senior person. Language is vetted. Perspective is vetted. Even how you drink your tea is vetted. We know how to change our behavior around different types of people. We just don't choose to make the effort around some people. Hmm. And I think we should start challenging that. As you said, you know, when you sit in front of a leader, you maybe wouldn't say the same things that you would around other people. Mm -hmm. So that is a choice. Yeah, it is no, to choose not to act. absolutely a choice. It's a choice to be unaware of who yeah. you are, that self-awareness piece again, and some of the programming that's in our heads that tells us certain type of people have certain associations. We, we have an idea of who makes a good scientist and, and the, the top of our head is not a, a woman. Medical science perhaps leans more towards it. Mm. it. It's just, it's programming that we've been given, but we don't have to live by that programming. Yeah, we've, we've got to take more control and take more responsibility. You know, I often reflect on what is the role of a leader to help drive organizational culture? I mean, for me, the shadow you cast as a leader is how we essentially make our culture happen, live and breathe. Yeah, culture is defined by the worst behavior that any person tolerates. Mm. 
that's what defines a culture, not whether you eject egregious offenders, not whether people are broadly compliant to the rules, but whether you tolerate small incivilities. Mm. It's the idea that this space that we're in now, as pristine and lovely as it is, it would take relatively small amounts of time if one person came by and dropped one small item mm. and nobody picked it up and another person dropped one small item. Over the course of the day, this place would be filled with detritus. Yeah. It would be an unsanitary mess. That's all it takes for cultures to devolve into that toxicity. Mm. We know over the last two years, the DEI agenda is something that all organisations are heavily and most importantly looking more into. What's the role of leadership in making that space happen? I mean, leaders are responsible for outcomes. It doesn't have to be a separate conversation about equity. Yeah. Here's your team meeting and here's my five minutes on inclusion. It's changing the way you operate, examining systems and processes to make sure that inbuilt bias isn't present and, and unintended consequences yeah. aren't occurring and that criteria exist for good contemporary reasons, yeah. not just because it's always been the that's way we've we done it. That's how we did it before, yeah. And that's all our responsibility in every moment. Um, it's our responsibility to make it so that every person knows on my team, you must speak up and I'm going to create space for that. It's, it's my responsibility as a leader to flex and that's what we should do to enable a, a broad, diverse group of people to operate well around us. It's us. Fully agree. And I think so. what you're saying about flex, I mean, you know, going through my career in terms of leading different teams and leading different people, one of the things that I often reflect on, how do I help the individual be their very best? How do I bring a team together? The future world of work demands a different caliber and quality of leader than we mm. had in the past. I think there's a whole group of leaders who have not experienced world wars and and come to this yes. point and have suddenly found that the world is more disrupted and challenging than they could ever could have imagined. Yeah. A new kind of leader is expected. The old kind of leader was about certainty and invulnerability mm. and inflexibility. It was about omniscience, knowing everything. And the new kind of leader is not that. They're about emotional literacy, the idea that you can connect with people, understand their human yeah. beings, enable their thriving, as in their performance in a workplace, by treating them differently in order to treat them fairly. Mm. It's about understanding yourself as a exactly. person and the impact you have. If you don't know who you are and what you stand for, you're going to cause harm. Yeah. It's like being a it's like being Godzilla walking through downtown if you're just unaware of your size and your impact and the fact that you're firing off flames in all kinds of directions yeah. you need to know who you are and your impact on other people i think one of the things that i you know me and the team are really heavily looking how do you design for inclusion right how do we sit down and say what does that look like in the everyday work what does that look like in ai what does that look like you know in how we build buildings and all of these different things is that the type of stuff you're talking about yeah the the infrastructure the policy the procedure really running the lens of how would x group of people experience y yes. but also recognizing that most of our decisions are made from a person's perspective mm. You know, buildings are built from the perspective of people who are ambulatory and can walk. Yeah. But it, it excludes certain people because of that. And then when we make accommodations, it's such a terrible way forward because it means, A, you have to spoil the design, which pisses everybody else off. Right. Why do we have to have this ramp? Because you didn't think about integrating yeah. this when you designed it. And that's why. So it is the thinking, recognizing that there is a prototypical person we are thinking about mm. when we build a policy or a procedure. So we need to broaden that definition of who needs their environment yeah. to work for them. Mm -hmm. When it comes to DNI, we talk about better, but we don't talk about getting there. Yeah. I'm 51 years old. When should I enter a building and not be seen as a threat, as a shoplifter or something else? Well, when people with disabilities can imagine going to a bar and being able to go to the loo and not find it filled with um, the cleaning equipment from, the, from that bar. Mm. And on, when gay couples, holding hands in non-queer spaces without the fear of retribution and on and on. It's not a journey. It's people's lives that yeah. are expiring while others procrastinate. And on this smaller scale, because I know you're a huge organization and there's lots of huge, but it's still a small and controllable scale. Yeah. It's a little ecosystem that you can, you really can think mm. about what it should look like in five or 10 years. And indeed most organizations 
have done exactly that. Yeah. But they just haven't considered this cultural element in the way that they should so strategically. But like many organizations with the future of work, you know, I keep I keep asking myself, and one of the things I think we're all kind of grappling with, how much does this continue? What does it call for that's different in terms of either leadership or how we show up, how we collaborate, how we connect and engage with each other? Yeah. A- any discussions or thoughts there? During the pandemic, we saw our colleagues as human beings. Yeah. And so now the leaders of the future, we can't go back. No person once seen as a person will go back to being a widget of productivity. Yeah. So if you as a leader are not capable, capable, if you as a leader are not willing to learn the skills to treat people who are going to differ from you to a larger or smaller extent with respect and dignity, then you're a dinosaur and the meteor's coming. Very quickly. Oh, very, it's, very it's quickly. on. We can see it. Yeah. It's hot. Yeah. It is not the strongest of a species that survives, nor the smartest. Hmm. It is the most adaptable that survives. That is true of individuals. It's true of species. It's true of businesses. Yeah. Adaptation. I think that's the key. It is. I've loved our fireside chat. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. And I think my big, big take home message is, you know, know that we can all be giants or we all are. We have an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Continue to call things out when you see them. You know, if you see something, say something, Mm -hmm. hold yourself and other people accountable and adapt to what is needed for now and for the future. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.